Uh, our talk tonight is uh, against intellectual property, the short refutation of meme, that is idea, communism. Actually, it's against, against intellectual property. You know, what did I say? You said against intellectual property. <laughs> Against against intellectual yeah, property, yes, yeah. ah, because my mistake. Against intellectual property is the book by Stephen Kinsella, spelt Stephen, but I believe pronounced Stephen, oh. as Neil Ferguson is not Niall Ferguson, even though it's spelt that way. He's still um, a nihilist. Yes, <laughs> and um, Against Intellectual Property is the short book which was previously an article in, I think it was, Libertarian Papers, uh, and it's virtually identical uh, to the original article, except for some strange reason. One footnote thanking Gene Callaghan for all his assistance seems to have disappeared <laughs> in the book. But otherwise, I can't, can't, couldn't find any difference. And it's a free download. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, this is... Uh, just five pieces of paper there, Cap. So this is going to be short. Right. <clears throat> but not as short as you'd like it to be. <laughs> this essay is intended to be a refutation of the main thesis in Against Intellectual Property, Kinsella, 2008. Hereafter, either Kinsella or K8, depending on how I'm feeling. I, I wrote K8 because I try to objectify these things and keep people out of it. Especially Kinsella. <laughs> Points of agreement, relatively trivial disagreement and irrelevant issues will largely be ignored, as will much repetition of errors in K8. Otherwise, the procedure is to go through it, quoting various significant erroneous parts as they arise and explaining the errors involved. It will not be necessary to respond at the same length as K8 itself. This talk uses the more philosophically sophisticated, as I like to imagine, new libertarian paradigm, as I like to call it, <laughs> that is non-morally liberty-based, ultimately pre-propertarian and critical rationalist. That is, of liberty as the absence of interpersonal proactive impositions, of their minimization in the event of clashes, and the explicitly conjectural nature of this theory and its desirability in practice. This clashes with the old libertarian paradigm, <laughs> as I like to call it very cheekily, which is mainly rights-based, ultimately physical propertarian and justificationist, <laughs> as is found in the essay being criticised here. The errors and their correction. Kinstella states that intellectual property rights, this is quotation, at least for patents and copyrights, may be considered rights in ideal objects. And that seems to be clear enough. But then Kinsella goes on to assert that A's ownership of ideal rights gives him some degree of control, ownership, over the tangible property of innumerable others. And this is possibly the most fundamental confusion in the paper, or in the book. Uh, to own an ideal object, or abstraction, or meme, is to have control over its use. If someone tries to use that ideal object in some way, such as by making goods based on it, without its owner's consent, then a defense of its ownership may ensue. That defense is not asserting any kind of ownership over the tangible property of innumerable others. By analogy, if someone has ownership of his own body or land or any physical thing, then he might defend that ownership from other people using their own bodies or external properties to use it without his consent. But neither is that defense asserting any kind of ownership over the tangible property of innumerable others. Despite explicitly referring to intellectual property, Kinsella is implicitly presupposing that only physical things can really be property and that any so-called intellectual property is really about imposing limits on or interfering with real physical property. Uh, another analogy, we might imagine the first person who tried to fence off a bit of land 
some Kinsella-like caveman would say, you're claiming rights in my, property, in my body now. I can't use my body to walk across that land. But obviously, you're not really claiming rights in that body. You're simply saying, if you can't walk across my land without permission, I'm claiming rights in this land, and I'm merely protecting it. So, but for some reason, for Kinsella, he only understands this could be property. He doesn't really take seriously the idea of that ideas could actually be owned. However, there is a grain of truth in what Kinsella states, and it is this. To make anything into private property, whether physical, including self-ownership, or intellectual, is usually thereby to impose at least very slightly on some other people. Being denied free access can be a new disutility. But if we assume that such ownership is universalized, then those other people, in their turn, are also able to enjoy the benefits of private property. And in this way, it is a lesser proactive imposition, that is, a lesser interference with liberty, to allow imposition minimizing private property, whether physical or intellectual, than it is to deny it. Therefore, it is mistaken to view such private property, whether physical or intellectual, as invasion or trespass, when it exists solely in order to minimize these things. Kinsella partly perceives and greatly magnifies the minimal imposition in intellectual property, but not, does not see any of the similar imposition in physical property. This is because Kinsella has adopted a purely physical propertarian view as inherently libertarian without having any explicit theory of liberty to explain this. Kinsella immediately repeats his error but goes on to add more when he states that patent and copyright invariably transfer partial ownership of tangible property from its natural owner to innovators, inventors and artists. The idea of a natural owner is some sort of appeal to natural law. Perhaps natural law exists, and perhaps it is libertarian. But to cite it appears to be adopt, to adopt a natural law theory rather than an explicitly libertarian theory, i.e. a theory that explains the relationship to interpersonal liberty. Moreover, if there is a natural owner for some tangible property, by whatever explanation, then there are also, one might suppose, ought to be a natural owner for intangible property by a parallel explanation. And who must any natural owner be if not one of the innovators, inventors and artists that produced it? Again, Kinsella is expressing a mere physical propertarian presumption. Kinsella goes on to assert that pro-IP arguments may be divided into natural rights and utilitarian arguments. What he is overlooking here is that pro-IP arguments can also include explicitly libertarian arguments, arguments that relate to liberty as such. And by asserting that libertarian IP advocates tend to adopt the former justification, Kinsella is also overlooking the critical rationalist epistemology that can put IP as a libertarian conjecture for explanation and defense from criticism rather than any futile attempt at a justification. For a putative justification implicitly and erroneously presupposes that it is possible to give epistemological support to a theory in a way that transcends a web of assumptions or conjectural framework to get to something stronger. Hence, while there is no justification, it is still possible to conjecture and explain that there can be liberty-based intellectual property, that it can promote utility or general welfare and libertarian rights too, and then consider any criticisms that purport to show that it does not. But Kinsella is only arguing here that there are fundamental problems with justifying any right or law on utilitarian grounds. As justification is not possible, Kinsella is right, but not for the reasons he advances. In a later discussion about property and scarcity, Kinsella tells us that, as libertarians recognize, following Locke, 
So apparently he's speaking for all of us here. It is only the first occupier or user of such property that can be its natural owner. Only the first occupier, homesteading rule, provides an objective, ethical and non-arbitrary allocation of ownership in scarce resources. This again seems to be referring, without any theoretical explanation, to natural law in its reference to a natural owner. So it seems to be about natural lawyers that merely and mysteriously self-identify as libertarians. In fact, the first occupier rule does approximate to what is libertarian. But in order to see this, one needs to have a theory of interpersonal liberty, such as, plucking an example almost at random, <laughs> not being proactively imposed on. Then it follows that allowing the first occupier to have a property claim will slightly proactively impose on non-first occupiers who now have to go elsewhere and might also be resentful or envious, etc. However, it would usually proactively impose more on people generally to not allow first occupier property claims. People would lose any investments they made in the property and productive activity would be undermined. So first occupier ownership is proactive imposition minimising, that is liberty maximising, as I see it, as a strong caterist paribus libertarian rule. But in unusual or emergency situations, it is possible that first occupier ownership needs to be either completely waived or at least temporarily reduced. For instance, Merely to be the first person to reach the sole natural water supply would not be enough to become its sole owner, as that would severely proactively impose on later arriving people. And in the event of some natural disaster that meant that people needed to flee across other people's land, then a first occupier claim would not be enough to bar their way, as that would severely proactively impose on would-be escapees. This is because in both cases, we have a pre-existing resource and not a benefit that the first occupier had created and was merely withholding. Thus, this theory of liberty provides a better objective, ethical and non-arbitrary allocation of ownership in scarce resources while relating it to liberty, of course. Strictly speaking, <coughs> the liberty maximising option is a factual matter and affirming this option's desirability is a completely separate moral or value matter. Kinsella continues, property rights are applicable only to scarce resources. Were we in a Garden of Eden where land and other goods were infinitely abundant, there would be no scarcity and therefore no need for property rules. Property concepts would be meaningless. The idea of conflict the idea of rights would not even arise. This cannot be entirely correct, if only because people would still want to own themselves, even if they were one of infinitely abundant clones. And there would also be value attached to particular examples of things. This is the very locket she gave me on that day. So it is not clear that property concepts would be meaningless just because goods were infinitely abundant in a physical sense. Such reservations aside, scarcity is a good explanation of the desirability of property rules. Those rules can maximise liberty by minimising proactive impositions with all the advantages of so doing. However, it is another fundamental error to go on to assert that the problem with IP rights is that the ideal objects protected by IP rights are not scarce. This is an error because each ideal object is a particular thing. There is only one ideal object, that is, Pythagoras' theorem, the number six, Mahler's second symphony, and so forth, which is not to imply that all these should be intellectual property. And there is a finite supply of valuable ideal objects that currently exist, often with no close substitute for a particular one. Kinsella is not taking 
the theory of ideal objects seriously as particular objects. Infinitely more than one physical use or physical instantiation of an ideal object might be possible, but that does not show that there is more than one ideal object of that kind. It makes sense to say that there is an ideal object that is a particular poem, but there cannot be two or more ideal objects that are this same poem. They conceptually collapse into the same one ideal object. What Kinsella really means, of course, is simply that the physical use of an ideal object does not deprive other people of that ideal object's use in any way. But that is false as well. Because one very important use for an ideal object just is to own it. And that ownership implies that the owner has control over its use. Kinsella is advocating the non-ownership or communism of ideal objects. A very odd thing for a libertarian to do. But that non-ownership will cause a tragedy of the commons as regards many of ideal objects. People will be less likely to attempt to produce, including by discovery, some ideal objects if they cannot own, exclusively control them once they are produced. Uh, <clears throat> in an interesting switch here, uh, Kinsella demands that people uh, provide an empirical justification of the need for uh, intellectual property, uh, sort of ignoring the a priori argument, uh, given that he's an a priori sort of Austrian type. You know, why, why the sudden switch? You can't have a justification anyway, but the a priori argument, I think, looks fairly strong. Uh, uh, of course you can't prove beyond any doubt whatsoever that the, uh, the thing empirically, but the a priori argument is so strong in terms of incentive. Uh, I think you've really got to fault it on those grounds. Uh, so consider a physical analogy. Suppose I build a machine that can produce widgets using air and natural light. The machine is also powered by air and, nat and natural light and never needs repairing. I switch on the machine and in seconds I have a month's supply of widgets to sell in the nearby market. When I am not a around, you come along and use the machine to make uh, the same number of widgets and you promptly go and sell them in the market yourself. Furthermore, you intend to continue repeating the procedure because I am, somehow we may suppose, unable to guard the machine adequately and you can always, somehow, beat me to the market. You assert that I've lost nothing because I still have access to my machine and to the widgets I made and to as many more widgets as I want. However, I didn't produce the machine uh, or the widgets for my personal use. I produced them solely in order to have something to sell. And now you have prevented that. Therefore, it is clearly false to claim that I've lost nothing and that my incentive to make such machines has not been undermined. And this appears to be sufficiently analogous with the position of many people who produce ideal objects with the intention of claiming them as intellectual property. Perhaps this is generally fairly obvious and convincing to most people who consider such matters. Confusion mainly arises if we allow the crude and false uh, and mutually reinforcing assumptions that only physical things can really be property, that there is no scarcity involved with valuable ideas, and that both any alleged intellectual property justice or consequentialist need to encourage the production of creative works and inventions must be justified, uh, which must not in any case constrain real physical property. Kinsella then makes a further error in asserting that such property rights are not and cannot be allocated in accordance with the first occupier homesteading rule. In fact, the first inventor or discoverer of an intellectual object could be regarded as a first occupier homesteading it, in a metaphorical sense, of course. The only problem would be the even greater crudeness of that rule in this case. For in order to avoid being a positive nuisance to, that is, 
proactively imposing on other people, it is necessary to time limit the ownership to likely or actual independent invention or discovery. Some sort of legal procedure involving experts would probably be required to approximate the non-proactively imposing length of a claim and any claims would likely always be subject to later appeals. One example Kinsella then gives us is this. If I invent a technique for harvesting cotton, your harvesting cotton in this way would not take away the technique from me. I still have my technique as well as my cotton. Your use does not exclude my use. We could both continue to use my technique to harvest cotton. There is no economic scarcity and no possibility of conflict over the use of a scarce resource. Thus, there is no need for exclusivity. Bearing in mind what has now been explained and taking the possibility of intellectual property seriously, this can more accurately and relevantly be reworded thus. If I invent a technique for harvesting cotton, intending to own that technique, your harvesting cotton in this way without my consent would take away the ownership of the technique from me. I do not still have my intellectual property technique as well as my cotton. Your non-contractual use does exclude my intellectual property use. We could both use my technique to harvest cotton, uh, but I have lost the intellectual property in the technique. There is economic scarcity in both the ownership and in the general supply of useful ideal objects, and thereby a possibility of conflict over the use of a scarce resource. Thus, there is a need for intellectual property exclusivity. Or consider this remark in Kinsella. Ideas are not naturally scarce. However, by recognizing a right in an ideal object, one creates scarcity where none existed before. As we have seen, there is both natural scarcity of valuable ideas generally, and also a scarcity with a particular idea in that a denial of producer ownership does deprive the producer of an intellectual asset he has created and thereby a considerable part of the incentive to produce valuable ideas. Hence, to deny producer ownership is to exacerbate scarcity, in opportunity cost terms at least, among valuable ideas. Of course, in the very short term, the abolition of intellectual property will reduce scarcity, but this is relevantly and sufficiently similar to the way that a reduction in scarcity would occur if factories, warehouses and shops were denied ownership of their physical products. Any immediate increase in supply would very soon turn into greater scarcity than would otherwise have existed. It is unnecessary to continue further with uh, Kinsella's book. The remainder of the text contains more repetition plus quotations from texts expressing similar views on material that is not really relevant to the main argument. Conclusion. In its advocacy of ideal object or meme communism, <coughs> sorry, in his ad advocacy, Kinsella makes various significant errors throughout. The two main errors are assuming that only physical things can really be property and that there is no scarcity involved with ideal objects. Many of the errors might have been avoided if only Kinsella had an explicit non-moral theory of interpersonal liberty by which to assess what is libertarian. In other words, Kinsella would not have had to resort to the old gallimore of dubious ad hoc assumptions presented as libertarianism if only it had taken liberty more seriously as the new libertarian paradigm does. Thank you. Any arguments or criticisms, Paul? Then. Yeah. Um, to clarify, um, yeah. in terms of uh, patents, the idea is that um, the first person to market has uh, exclusive rights up until some likely committee decided the second possible discoverer of the, of the uh, technique or the invention or whatever. 
and in terms of copyright... Uh, and if he's identifiable, then maybe he should share it. Well, let me get to the question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in terms of copyright, yeah. uh, your invention... Yeah, you, you've written you know, Bleak House, you're a child, so you've yeah. written Bleak House. That work is yours and your descendants add into that yeah, in yeah. perpetuity because yeah. there's never any item that could ever be reproduced. So yeah. that's the difference between patents and copyright. Yeah, yeah. So to move to patents, as they, normally you often have a number of organisations, inventors, working towards a solution. Yeah. Now, one of them gets to market first. They yeah. invent a new drug yeah. or a television set or whatever. They get to market first. Yeah. And so, so Logie Beard invents a television set. He has exclusive rights for it until we imagine that, say, Mark Coney or whoever else might have been working on it. Yeah. But, and they say, well, it's about two years. Yeah. So after two years, is it then a complete free-for-all or is it then... Do we have to go around trying to trace everybody who's working on it and working out how long they might have done it? And if there's a clear... Ex yeah. Unbelievably tricky committee working out who was looking at it, and that seems to me to be an unbelievably bureaucratic and difficult thing to achieve. Well, it's, it's no more bureaucratic and difficult than... <laughs> having supermarkets with checkouts rather than letting people have free access. Oh, all well, this money, carrying all this money around, <laughs> yeah. getting change. Yeah, sure, yeah. what a palaver. If you don't have it, there wouldn't be a supermarket uh, and you'd be lucky to get bread and water. Uh, so my idea would be that, I mean, if there was a clear second person, you say, OK, you, you, you're so close, it's clear you would have got there within, say, six months. So in six months, you're going to have to share. Yeah. If there's a third, then maybe they should. But after a while, there wouldn't be anybody, uh, and uh, but they, but there would have been somebody, but no yeah. identifiable person. So we could say, uh, you know, because it was in the air, you know, other people would have turned to it. So let's say now between persons one, two, and three, or organisations one, two, and three, uh, let's say this would have carried on for ten years or so. You know, for the sake of argument, uh, then after ten years, because there is no identifier of other person, it will become uh, go into the commons. Yeah, anybody then anybody can use it. Um, and I mean, I've nothing against things going into the commons. Eventually, there's nothing inherently uh, uneconomic about that. I mean, there'd be nothing uneconomic about somebody producing a wonderful idea and then just giving it away. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's fine if, if that's what you want to do. It, uh, you just you ought to be able to have the option of saying, "Well, I just like to make a bit of money out of it first. You know, and, that's and, why I did. Well, and suppose suppose the first person to invent the television gets it to market and then gives it away. He then turns it to some franchises. The second person you might have got their six. No, that's interesting. Yeah, want to give it away. Ah, no, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Uh, Aha. No, no. Not so much for that. Uh, Isn't the answer that he just lost the race? Yeah, I think you might, might be right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, yeah, exactly. So but it wouldn't, it wouldn't disincentivize you most people. You have the right to give it away, and it's just tough tits. That's right. You give away yeah. what you had, what you yeah. had for the first well, The, the second person like, would have uh, been, the second person would have been a, a half <laughs> owner. Yes. So I must, I, I don't have, uh, I'm sort of sympathetic to the second owner person who, well, getting so some I'm sim I just it's sympathetic but I can't I can't theoretically explain whether it should go one way or the other off the top of my head it hadn't even occurred to me before no. well you have the right to give away what you own don't you Nico uh, yeah I think you're, you're absolutely right to say that um, uh, ideal objects are scarce in a sense in the sense that they have you know clear limits you can clearly identify them as one object yeah. but they're clearly differently scarce from physical objects in the sense that uh, they can be used simultaneously by everyone once they are exist, which is not true for any physical object. Any physical object has a limit. Except the use of ownership, which is a kind yes. of use. Yeah, Except, yeah. well, that, that, well, that, well that's, that's, that's what, you, what you're trying to, yeah. uh, to get into. Well, it is a kind of use, isn't it? Yeah, okay. And even if they were multiple. Then, but, yeah. but, when, when you take your, your theory of libertarianism, then you, you say you have to minimize impositions on people. Yeah. And um, basically disallowing people to use something that is, uh, which use is not limit, and which doesn't decay, which is also a, a different thing from, from, uh, yeah. from physical objects, is, is a bit of an op in, imposition. So the, the question is, what is the minimizing imposition? Is it, is it um, 
I agree with you, we need to have it yeah. in order for these ideas to come into existence. But yeah. once they are in existence, we don't need well, ownership to, to, uh, to maintain this I mean, the imposition, the imposition is it's just like if you grow apples and somebody steals all your apples, you put all the work in. You, 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 you grow an idea and then somebody just takes away the idea, you put all the work in, there's your, there's your loss. All of your investment has been lost because yes. somebody's just walked away with it. That's, yeah. your, that's your loss. But, uh, uh, but then, and you say, what would, what would society be like if nobody was allowed to uh, you know, uh, either no, grow no, apple trees I'm or grow that... apple computers uh, in terms of property rights? Th then we'd all be worse off because there'd yes. been fewer of both. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that um, maybe there should be some intellectual property, but then it should be limited. For example, physical property can be inherited to other people because it has to, you know? Yeah. Someone has to inherit it. It's just a, it's yeah. just a necessity. I don't see any need for, for doing that, for example, if there is something like intellectual property, to make this uh, something that, that can be inherited to someone else because that clearly doesn't, doesn't create any incentive to anyone. Oh, it does. I mean, you're, uh, I mean you're, 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 you're <laughs> may, you may well be thinking about, um, because we're, this is imagining a world ultimately where we don't have any welfare state or anything and you want to ensure, you know, your family is supported after your death yes, and carries on. Yes, but then I would argue that would, put, call, uh, uh, that would uh, put more proactive imposition on the, on the people who might want to use it and might put, put it to, to useful use uh, than, than it, it poses on the... Um, on the on the um, inheritance uh, of, of, of that property if, if, if we give it away. I mean, I mean if, you can, if you can keep it for yourself, I can't see why you can't give it to somebody else, especially, you know, your children or whatever. Uh, it looks like it's just as much as an imposition on you to say, and maybe more, you say, it's not me, I didn't do it for myself, I did it because I, to help my family. And, if that's the thing that I can't, if they're the people I can't help, that's what I cared about most. That's a greater imposition on me. There's a, another aspect that occurs to me, which is um, if after, a, you say, after the original inventor discoverer dies, then it's anybody's, then maybe you're sort of taking away part of the incentive to create. People, people uh, think, well, or, well, or, or, in, or gi giving an incentive to kill, to kill, kill the <laughs> discoverer or inventor, of course. Well, as soon as we've killed him, we can do what we like with it. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that, that will be a bit extreme, I think. But um, the, the other thing that, that, um, that uh, opponents of intellectual property bring forward is that yeah. uh, these ideas are, of course, often taken and then improved upon uh, yeah. by others. Yeah. And yes. If they don't have the right to use it, then these improvements would never happen. Well, well they, they'd have to negotiate. It, they, uh, I mean, they, they negotiate with the original person. Say, I've invented an improvement. I, I've, I've uh, I, I, you know, applied for a copyright or whatever, or a patent on the improvement. Um, there's this much money to be made. Can we do a deal? And they, you know, they, they do a deal. Oh, yeah. but, but always, with, with anything like an invention or a discovery, there's likely to be a very definite uh, uh, period that's not so long in the future before somebody else will come up with it. So, you know, you've you got to profit while you can because once the committee, as it were, decides, well, that's when independent invention or discovery would have occurred anyway, then you're going to lose, then you're going to lose it. Yeah. Okay. Paul? But then, then Bob? It is, there are, then it's not identical. I mean, I admit there are differences. I just think that intellectual property is not so very different. It's relevantly similar to uh, uh, physical property, sufficiently relevantly similar, oh, yeah, that it shouldn't be treated like it's something completely different. No, that, that yeah. I agree on, but I, I, I see... But there's not, I see not the, yeah, I there see are certain limits to it. Like, for example, I, I don't agree with you on the inheritance thing, I think. You don't? That, 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 that would I'll tell your father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, to move to copyright, um, to test that a bit more. Um, m most, when most copyright objects are marketed, and I can't see why this wouldn't be different in a libertarian thing, they're marketed with, uh, usually you have fair use to quote some text from a book, uh, if you sing a song, you're normally prevented from um, publicly performing it or selling it on, but you're yeah. allowed to sing it in your own home for your own amusement or something. 
Yeah. So there's normally all these fair use provisions, which I assume would probably be the same. Uh, yeah. Relevant. You know, you, you, like, in, in a libertarian world, you know, you you you, you can't you can't prevent people singing happy birthday at birthday parties if you bring the song or uh, and. It's maybe not in a public occasion. Um, but, a public occasion, yeah, or you can't broadcast yeah. it, things like that. But there's usually, I say, there's, there's usual rules that these, these things are sold and marketed with fair use for yeah. a little bit of sampling, a bit of use for yeah. fair quotation, so forth. That's yeah. fine. Um, and I see that's the thing. Um, also, what happens now is, I think it's, I think there's a rule about 70 years after the author's death, it yeah. then becomes free domain. Now, presumably, uh, there's that's, but since that's just an entirely arbitrary made up figure, seventy. Yeah. There's nothing objective about that, and I can't see it. I can't see any other way of objectively saying that it goes on. So it would just be, it would just be sort of a in perpetuity. You could, yeah. as long as you've got so Shakespeare, yeah. if we could identify all of his things yeah. and he bequeathed them all, yeah. that would just go on and go on. If somebody dies intestate, perhaps what happens with intellectual property? We, we presumably just be left to go to the government. Uh, so <laughs> well, I would say it would go to the commons. Go to the commons. I would guess yeah. so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, and then, if we, say, take an example of that, I think there's a Czech author called Franz Kafka, who famously wrote all these novels, some of them thought to be very good, and he didn't publish them during his lifetime, and he yeah. said to his executor of his will, yeah. destroy them all, never publish them. It's yeah. the correct libertarian thing to do, to find every single last copy of those yeah. and destroy it. Well, that's just... That's a separate sort of a problem that's not really specific to this because it could apply to any uh, any any kind of property. Mm. Should should you be able to destroy it, and just because the owner says so, and uh, uh, it could be that um, uh, I mean, uh, what you know, is it, is it contractual? Is anybody prepared to enforce the contract? No, no. If nobody's prepared to enforce no. the contract, I don't imagine then, the yeah, we're, we're obviously yeah. flouting liberty, but I don't think the punishment. Yeah. I'd just like to say one thing. I'd like, yeah, I'd like to say one thing uh, about um, somebody always owning it. One of uh, one of the reasons that um, I've been told that many playwrights in Shakespeare's time were as good or better than Shakespeare by some people who claim to know more about this than myself and maybe they're right and but one of the reasons these things fall into desuetude is that nobody does own them i mean if somebody said to me all the works of beaumont and fletcher are now yours i'd be racking my brains to think now how can i tell people about these plays and how good they are and get them performed and actually I'll probably just sell them to somebody else but that person, <laughs> yeah. that person I sold them more, to, more motive, yeah. he would he would do all that and just pay me uh, but but that would then you then you've got a bit of incentive to uh, keep it going rather than so, so it's something go, becoming a common property is not necessarily a solution, it can it can actually be a problem but, and it and it could become such a problem that if something, say, a piece of music, and many pieces of music just get sort of lost and put in a shelf on the library, and that, it, 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 if you say, well, if it's nobody's using it, it's like the land that nobody's using it. If you find it and it, you can claim it, and it then becomes your property, uh, it then becomes your property, and uh, it may be. I'm just thinking this thing through and, and it might then actually gives people some incentive to find these lost things rather because otherwise if you find it uh, and you can't you've got no rights to it whatsoever then only pure scholarship can motivate you and a pure scholarship means people sitting around in a cold room <laughs> Paying too much for student beer, uh, rather than all the joys of corporate goodies and freebies, which is you know. But the seventy-year rule will be. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, they would have to, this, yeah, I, I've nothing. I can't see anything wrong with in perpetuity, as partly as it, as it encourages other people to. And it, what's you know what's your, what they, nobody's no nobody's lost anything. Well, they haven't been proactively imposed on. If 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 you don't want to um, perform it, even. Well, presumably, I think Charles Dickens has got some grandchildren or great grandchildren alive, and they can't get any money from all the endless adaptations of his. Of his yeah, so, yeah, I think it would be. Uh, also, as your 
descendants multiply, uh, my, yeah. well, uh, well, no, no, no. I mean, who, uh, yeah. you, you leave it to an unidentifiable person, leave it to an unidentifiable yeah. Anyway, if you put the price too high, yeah. I mean, this elasticity of demand. Yeah. Like, uh, so, yeah. if that's what you're charging, we're not simply not going to make another yeah. version of Bleak House or whatever. Yeah. So, you're going to have to price it right. And the, the price that you charge is very unlikely to be much of the production right. cost. I agree. All the actors and the producers and whatever. So it's you know it's very very minimal, but does give you a bit of incentive to push it rather than not. Well, uh, a couple of factual matters. Um, I believe uh, due to lobbying by the German government, um, copyright on books or written materials is now inching up towards 90, 80, would have been some much higher figure. If yeah. that's a good or bad thing, that's, that might be of interest. Um, also, another factual matter, um, it's, we always think how sad it was that this chap working in a garage yeah. who thought of the idea first, didn't copyright it first, and then misses out. Even in America, I believe, if you could prove that you did it yeah. before, you, you, don't, don't, you don't get it all. You don't have to run to the patent yeah, office. You do get to uh, 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 and anything you write is automatically yes. copyright nowadays, usually, uh, which is, I think... On a more abstract matter, as it could, you make it, could you explain the distinction between maximising liberty yeah. For years, I've thought of yeah. a thing that can be maximised is more like opportunity. But now that maybe maybe called liberty, I suppose, or positive liberty, or something like that. One. Make the distinction between preserving liberty <coughs> in a situation by acknowledging this or that property right, yeah. and maximising liberty in general. Before I do that, I just I thought you were going to talk about Mein Kampf, which is owned by the Bavarian government, and they're just it's just about to come out of. That's Copy right. right. Been it's this week, yep. Yeah. Uh, sending all or some of the proceeds to Israel. I no, uh, no one wants to read that. No. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they won't once they start it. The bizarre thing <laughs> about Mein Kampf is it's, I think it was the only book that was banned in Germany. And it was, uh, obviously, it was the book that all young people wanted to buy in Germany on Amazon because it was the one book they were told, you mustn't read this book. You can read any book you like, but you mustn't read this one. So they were all... Got to get a copy of this book. Uh, yeah, now, I don't know uh, who would uh, officially own it, yeah, but uh, anyway. It makes, just, it makes Hagel look clear. Also, you shan't be able to read all of it, does that mean? Yeah. Um, uh, so, maximising versus preserving. Yes. Um, uh, the idea of uh, maximising liberty is uh, I usually use in the sense that there are inevitable clashes of liberty. For instance, it's uh, uh, the very fact that we own ourselves means that other people can't just enslave us and whatever. And it's a bit of a nuisance that, that, that uh, you can't just go around enslaving people. On the other hand, it's really good that people can't enslave you uh, yourself. So on, you know, uh, it, it maximizes liberty that people own themselves. That's the, on that basis, I see, I see, so I don't say ownership, I don't see even self-ownership as axiomatic. It's, it's simply, if, if liberty is people not imposing each other on each other, uh, there are all kinds of rules that you can have. Um, any rule that you have will impose on people to some extent. The question is, what's the least extent that it imposes? Yep. Self-ownership impo imposes less on people than any other rule like you can have slavery. So with no imposition now, or maximising opportunity. Now, uh, 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 now, the now, now maximising opportunity or maximising liberty. Well, you see, you were repeatedly saying you seem, to, you seem to be happy when there's no imposition. Well, if there's no proactive imposition, you have perfect liberty. I mean, and we all commit suicide. Uh, uh, there's no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, there's a separate <laughs> theoretical problem there. Oh, uh, it's... Uh, with, you often have perfect liberty with respect to almost everybody in the world, except the people who are near you are always a nuisance, uh, and you to them. Uh, so you've got to rub along somehow, so you come up with rules that minimise the imposition. Uh, in a sense, yes, uh, uh, this, I think it's implicit in the theory of minimising impositions that... Um, you assume that once people exist, you're minimising. You're not just trying to abstractly minimise impositions, uh, by, you know, which you, you might think you could do by killing anybody, but that's dubious because you're, you're imposing on them by killing them. 
and you're also not for long. Are, are, well, uh, you're also arguably imposing on the people who would have existed, mm -hmm. imposing on future people. That's who who you're who you're absence prevented of, that's who you're an absence of opportunity to prevented to, they, they're prevented from coming into existence and that's that you know that's that which is I says even worse than uh, being killed. Should be said twenty five years ago we were <laughs> yeah. I was explaining opportunityism as yeah. I'm going as other words. There's uh, but I mean this uh, I don't I I, um, I can't yeah, I can't rephrase what I think what I what I have to say in terms of opportunities, though there's obviously I think you do have more opportunities when you have more liberty and you have more liberty insofar as people impose on each other as little as possible, proactively impose on each other as little as possible. Uh, but I mean it could be that it's not absolute and uh, this is a form of what you might call uh, rule libertarianism. I mean private property is a is, 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 uh, uh, Caterus Paribus rule. Self ownership is a Caterus uh, Not killing people. You know, we can imagine where sometimes you you just do need to kill somebody to do something, and even though it's a self ownership, you have so many advantages, of, or it's just necessary under the circumstances. But other things being equal, that rule is. Ah, so you're saying no, reduce imposition or no imposition, commensurate with not losing something else, which is not imposition. Um, so it looks like it's going to be opportunities. It's kind of like a mini bank or something like that. Uh, I mean, uh, liberty is the uh, the goal, but uh, we can imagine circumstances where something might override liberty. And sufficiently sufficiently large amount of welfare might be a good reason to scotch somebody's liberty. Uh, in theoretically, that. So I think it's. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not. Uh, I, d I don't believe in absolute libertarianism in that sense. It just, it just looks like libertarianism is a good thing, almost always, but very special cases, maybe not. Should we choose other people? Though? Yes. So, well, first of all, Paul, and then the lady, and then David. Yeah, just, just to take a tangent. If, if you do kill somebody, you, you definitely impose on them to the extent that they would have had a remaining life to, to enjoy. Yeah. If you deprive them, that's a significant thing. You've also imposed on all the people who <laughs> like them, love them, wealth them, enjoy their company yeah. as a wrestling position. You definitely haven't imposed on any possible descendants because uh -huh. in that case, you're at the disco, you're chatting up the girl, her best friend comes along and cock blocks you, gets in the way. You might have had kids. She's now, you, she's now, she's now imposing all, yeah. all the descendants you might have had. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that can't be but, but, there's, but there's a difference with, <laughs> with fair competition in the disco and, and killing somebody. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> Not in terms of imposing on possible decisions. You know, uh, the thing is, which which rule <laughs> will proactively impose least? And fair competition amongst uh, potential reproductive partners imposes le less than uh, than allowing people to commit murder. Uh, that, I mean, that doesn't have an upside, really. No. Other, well, unless the one person said, "Well, I really hated him." I think, <laughs> great now. That, that, that upside doesn't count well, By much. and large, we, we were assuming that killing people is wrong. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. what's more, uh, uh, it conflicts with liberty. Yes. Uh, the lady uh, behind Paul. Um, can you clarify in what sense ideal objects are scarce? Is it just that they're scarce and they're not imposed on them? Or is it that they're scarce and they're That's they're the main... Uh, they're, they're, well, they're scarce in two senses. Ideal objects are scarce in the ownership of them is, 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 is one scarce. I mean, you might create an ideal object only in order to own it and for no other reason. And if somebody deprives you of that, you know, they've deprived you of the one thing that you want. That's, uh, 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 so they're scarce in that sense, but they're also scarce in the sense that there are not an infinitely large number of good ideal objects uh, such that if you can't have this one don't worry there's another one over here just almost as good there isn't sometimes often there is nothing as good you would you this is the ideal object you need and nothing else will uh, be a good substitute so uh, and that's where again where incentives come in if you want to have more good ideal objects valuable ideal objects then we want to give people incentives to create these valuable ideal objects 
not take the incentives away by saying, as soon as you've created one, we're not going to allow you to have any benefits other than you can get just by using it yourself. Uh, then obviously this has got to undermine people's uh, incentives to produce it. But the, so in those two senses, but it's not, it's, yeah, they're not exactly like physical objects. But I'd say I, my position is really that the, the analogy is uh, sufficient for them not to uh, escape ordinary propertizing. Uh, the idea that, oh, they just doesn't make any sense to make them into property. It makes very good sense to make them into property for, for reasons that are sufficiently similar to private property, even though they're not identical. Well, the, I mean, the, they are the number of uh, valuable objects, valuable ideal objects, actually is scarce. That's a fact. I mean, there's just not an infinite number of uh, uh, ideal, good ideas, uh, that are such that um, one is as good as another. And you want to, you want that. And there are most of the good ideas probably haven't even been thought of yet, and we want to encourage people to create them. By, and by ideas, I mean both discoveries and inventions. They're, they're, so they're definitely scarce in that sense. I, I can see how it looks like I, I might be uh, uh, assuming what I'm trying to show by saying that you people ownership is a form of scarcity, but then it is. That's what you know. People are either either somebody owns an ideal object or nobody owns it, um, and uh, uh, there is only this one ideal object. So it, that sounds, it looks like a sort of like a, seems like a kind of ownership. Uh, seems like a kind of scarcity to me. Uh, I may have to develop that bit to make it a bit more convincing. David. Yeah. There is less incentive yeah. to invest money in producing good production type ideas, drugs, whatever. On the other hand, as uh, it's also probably fair to say, that a patent type system makes the improvement of ideas probably slower and difficult because, as I think you accepted, it requires at a minimum negotiation and agreement with the original idea owner for an improvement can yeah. be brought to market, etc., uh, etc. Et so it does seem to me that, that although it is fairly obvious, mm. the incentive for original production is enhanced by, by patent ID, it's not quite as obvious that overall mm. the world is better off with the patent. Yeah. On the one hand, you have a greater incentive, but on the other hand, improvement becomes more difficult. Well, and, and one could certainly conceive of yeah. the world in which you don't have patent protection for your original ideas, you have to protect them in some other way, yeah. whether by commercial secrecy, or by first mover advantage, and so on yeah. and so forth. So perhaps it's more difficult to protect your original investment. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. the communism of improvement yeah. leads to a much better rapid improvement of those ideas that are produced. So it's not so obvious to me that, that some form of patent IP yeah. is necessarily a good thing from a welfare point of view. But if you own uh, an ideal object and you know that there's probably going to be some finite time that you've been allotted because before it was independently discovered or invented, uh, uh, and then somebody comes along with this add-on, uh, why would you, you know, as a business, say, no, I don't want anything to do with you? Because he's offering you an extension. You're going to get immediately greater profits, and, the, and uh, you can negotiate that this continues for a so while. You can stand back for a moment and ask yourself how many people are even going to bother to start the process of improving an idea, knowing that it's really a patented idea. I agree with you. Once you have somebody who yeah. has improved an idea, they can certainly come along and say, well, we're, we've got an improvement, let's get together, etc. 
But in a world in which there are already patterns for neutral ideas, most people won't even bother. Whereas if you had a world in which there were no patterns for ideas, any idea that had come to market that could be improved, mm. the whole world was going to improve. It depends how it so works, because it, it, it's, it's, it depends how the additional, the add-on works. It could be that um, if the patented uh, system is a computer program and you're just giving them something that they can run on that program, it won't run on anything else but that program, but it will run on that program, then you, maybe you don't even need to negotiate with the original people because you just say, well, I've made something that will, that you, that will work on Windows. Let's, uh, just, let's just suppose that, for the sake of argument, that yeah. criticism is a good one. Yeah. And that there is a respectable case to say that overall welfare might actually be improved by reducing the incentive for creating original ideas, but it effectively improving the incentive for improving original ideas. And if that were the case, would it then follow that on the basis of your theory of liberty, we shouldn't have patents? Oh, uh, if it was a, if it imposed more to have uh, uh, property. Then yeah, yeah. Then I mean, it's contingent. Yeah, well, I wonder it's, if this is actually. But but, but I, I find it hard to. I find it hard to believe that it would because every original idea is uh, that's an invention or discovery is likely to have a finite time. So even if they say they refuse to have anything to do with anybody who wants to negotiate, they say, well, okay, we've only got to wait till you're pattern runs out and then we do it anyway because then it becomes <laughs> it goes into the commons and we're going to do it so so we'll either you negotiate with us and we pay you money now or we wait five years when it goes on okay so there's okay there's a bit of empiricism here but then that's exactly the sort of thing that uh, you would need some sort of experts to sort of look at and work at work out are people merely are we allowing people to uh, internalise the benefits that they're creating, or are they, to a certain extent, being a nuisance? And it could be, in some cases, it goes one way, and in other cases, it goes the other. Uh, it and must the, be the rule first and the expert second, allowing the expert to determine what the like rule is. The like rule comes from the analysis. From, from your analysis. I mean, the idea is that you mustn't do something which is uh, more of a nuisance to people than it is a benefit and it, it could be that we can imagine certainly we can imagine some kinds of intellectual property in principle being more of a nuisance than a benefit and if that's were the case then we then I, then the, the, the committee the commission is going to be competing committees and whatever would say well in this instance it doesn't seem to work, and therefore, in, the, in this instance, we won't allow it. So, there's a bit of leeway built into the system. I just, I just have a general prediction that there would be, there certainly would be, some intellectual property, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything can be intellectually propertized because there are reasons why certain things couldn't be, and it, or it's not practical, or it's too trivial, or yeah. So, but so I think, I think there's a bit of room in the system. For, for, for a difference without undermining the whole thing and saying that compromises the very idea of intellectual property. In the same sense, the fact that sometimes you want to have common property or you can have common property doesn't undermine the idea that generally private property works very efficiently and is highly desirable. Uh, you, you can have both. Bob? Um, yes, it does seem as if the point I made on um, I left here that we, we do seem to have opportunity in one, in one sense and something which relates to it and is called liberty, preserving liberty, maximizing liberty or whatever but the, um, the payoff seems to be in terms of um, welfare or opportunities and then the cost yeah. of this is also in the lack of opportunity yeah. and you may call that preserving liberty, maintaining liberty or maximizing yeah. liberty uh, in a sense if we're not arguing about such different terms doesn't really matter yeah. Uh, another point to make is um, you and whose army. Um, this may seem a bit cheap because this can apply to any law, perhaps. But um, all right, you've got the copyright. Hey, you've got the copyright. Yeah. What are you going to do? 
you know, who's going, who's going to stop us making use of this idea? Yeah. That's, what, that's what the Americans said to Charles Dickens. Well, indeed, yeah. and uh, I, I might as well put this in now because I was thinking of it. Um, what, what happened then is what happens now with supergroups. What you do is you can't stop, you can't stop the music flying around the world yeah. as soon as it's, as it's announced. What you do is you make your money out of the tours. Yes. Because then you have to come in person to get, to get the real good. So they can make enough awesome money simply by touring, and that's exactly what Charles Dickens had to do. Yes, to really nice. get the money rolling in. Yeah, yeah, he had yeah. to go there and charge some tickets to see in person. He made lots of money that way. There's a more general problem, really, which is, I mean, how will libertarian law work? And uh, uh, we're presupposing, I think, or we're, we're supposing that in a libertarian culture, once enough people yeah, understand and want uh, property rights based on liberty, then uh, there'll be some people who are outside the system and they'll be regarded as pirates or crooks or whatever. And uh, there'll always be some of them. That's unavoidable, but uh, you know, generally, uh, intellectual property would be policed the same as physical property. It wouldn't be very different. But what you said about opportunity made me think, uh, yes, there is a sense in which liberty can be uh, uh, unpacked in terms of opportunity, yes, because to take away an opportunity that somebody has uh, and would have had, except for your interference, is in some sense to interfere with his liberty. And especially if it has repercussions for the growth, uh, the growth uh, and opportunity later, yeah, could, but, could they have the copyright? But, but if he can increase his opportunities by interfering with you, then I would call that license, not liberty. So, uh, because mm. this opportunity as such is not liberty. And also, there could be an island full of people calling themselves libertarians who don't recognise copyright, but they have a good life yeah. and they get on. Yeah. Of course, it only has to operate sufficiently well in enough places to, to work. And the, the fact that there are these islands where they say, "Oh well, we just do what we like here with intellectual property," you know, but not many people live there, so mm. it, there's enough incentive to make the system operate elsewhere. It's, it needn't be perfect to be good enough. Paul, and then, I forgot your name, and then this chap behind, so it's Paul. Yeah, just to return to David's point about um, if you've got an improvement or an add-on, or something to the negotiation, I think, if you look at what happens in the real world, you know, the copyright, <coughs> uh, if it's, um, say, for instance, I think this happens a lot in music, uh, you sample somebody else's song. And sometimes they might go and ask for permission, but I think what happens often is they just simply sample somebody else's song, stick it in your record, mark it anyway, and then say, well, see me, uh, and we'll, then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you whatever. You know, they don't give them the opportunity to ban it out right from the start. They simply put it to market if they think it's good enough. Yeah. So you've created a rap song, you've sampled a bit of an old song to the else in, put it in yeah. there, you tend it to market and then let them sue you for... And it could work that way with add-ons. And, and yeah. add-ons and all kinds of things yeah. like that. So if you think you've got a valuable add-on, you don't you know, uh, 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 negotiate, and, uh, but you can just bring it to market, yeah. present with the fate complete, and, and then somebody say, might and then say, say... And then say, well, let the court yeah. decide what your fair share, yeah. what your or, or, or what your loss is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, and, you're, and, so and, you're, and you'll, soon, and you'll be compensated at you'll be, If you're completely compensated for your loss... Yeah. If 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 what you if your song makes no money, they won't bother suing you. If it's a worldwide hit and millions, then they've probably got an incentive to try and grab a bit of that cash, you know. So that's, yeah. that's what happens. Yeah, I mean there are. I know it's not my term, but there are two problems with that. One is that the threat of litigation would be a terror to many, if not all. And secondly, if the litigation succeeds, you may find that you end up paying all the profits over. Case, the threat of that litigation is an even greater threat. So yeah. yes, I agree with Paul that obviously the existence of the threat does not deter everybody from improving, but the existence of, of the threat of quite serious litigation mm -hmm. taking the profit might be quite a big deterrent to quite a lot of people. So yeah. sure well, we might hope that we, have, we might hope that litigation mm -hmm. is a more uh, congenial, quick, and efficient affair in a libertarian society rather than the Highly strong, how loyal, like loyal, John loyal, Dyson, John loyal, Dyson. Loyal, 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 <laughs> loyal pocket line in that is a statism, <laughs> but I'm, not, so I'm just, I'm like just, that. I wouldn't count. I'm just suggesting that. Like yeah. Your name's not Brand, is it? What is? Yeah. Brent. Brent. Um, oh, Brent. To do with this, this idea, the scarcity of ideal objects. Yeah. Um, perhaps it's not that the objects themselves are scarce; it's the path to finding them 
that is, is scarce. I mean, the development, so if you're developing something, a physical thing, and you producing it, it, there can be a lot of research and development. You can try all sorts of things that don't work, and finally yeah. you get it right, the yes. light bulb, right? Yeah. You've put a lot of energy into it, but there's a path to get to that thing. Yeah. Once you've then produced it, you know then how to make it, you can then produce that and sell it, so you can benefit from it. Yeah. With ideas, it's a similar thing. I mean, Newton was the only guy that thought hard and long enough and figured out gravity, right? And he had to invent calculus at the same time to do it. And another guy invented calculus almost at the same time. Leibniz. He didn't get the gravity. I think that he did pick it up on the physics. Yeah. You know, you've got, to, you've got to spend a lot of resources thinking and maybe experimenting and figure things out. But that's the thing that makes it scarce. You can't, you can't get to some ideal objects without having figured out the other ones. The uh, I, I'm not sure that, that, I mean, that in a sense that, uh, that it, it's so hard to get there that not many people will get there. But, but, the, but once you're there, I mean, the theory of gravity, just as you happen to mention it, it's, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a particular theory of gravity that is Newton's, and there's only one of them, isn't there? So in that sense, it's scarce, it's yeah. one of them. <laughs> Uh, 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 I don't. I mean, I, I should imagine there's maybe more than one route to to get to it. But certainly, to get to certain outcomes may require a lot of research and development. But that's more to do with investment, and that's why one reason why <coughs> we want to allow people to have some kind of property claim in it eventually is because otherwise they wouldn't have put all that research yeah, and development. Right. They, it just wouldn't have been worth their while if, if they can't get the fruits of it in any way, shape or form at the end of it all. So that must undermine incentives. And so, but I don't see that it, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the scarcity. It's just other than the, the, the your resources that you use uh, to get there are maybe right. scarce and they're competing with other resources, but it's, it's not the, the ideal object is still a single thing. So. Oh, finally. <laughs> yeah, uh, to what extent do you think that modern technology has made IP more less relevant? So maybe like in the 18th century, there's sort of someone tinkering around in a workshop and they physically did something. But in the 21st century, we, we, we're so easy to, to communicate information and, sort of, and we can be more and more networked. Do you not think that continuing to have the IP in that sense might start to become more of a hindrance than a help? Even if perhaps in the past it was it was useful, do you know? Do you? Think <coughs> that uh, uh, that, yeah, but yeah, I'm reminded of the, you know, in the, in the patent office where they famously said, you know, with with almost everything that's been invented is been invented now, and soon we'll be closing the office down. They think that, that every single year. <laughs> so one chap who wrote the end of science in 1990, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> The, the point is, if it really, I mean, it, 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 just because intellectual property exists, for one thing, uh, you can just opt out and say, I don't want anything to do. I, I'm not going to take that route. If you don't want to take it, you don't have to take it. Uh, for another thing, if it turns out, as I said earlier, that certain kinds of intellectual property are so econo uneconomic that they're actually more of a nuisance to people than not having them. Like the fashion industry. Maybe, then, you know, I haven't really thought a lot about that. But, uh, <laughs> well, I just, they don't um, uh, use ideas. Yeah, but, yeah, but then, then, and in those cases, or it's, or it's just not economic to bother, you know, the fact that somebody does going to do some sort of a knockoff somewhere, as long as they're not claiming to be your company, which, well, which would be fraudulent, yeah. yeah. Uh, then maybe it doesn't matter to you, so it's not just not worth bothering or anything. It could, so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, my idea of intellectual property is not that, you know, with an iron fist it must be enforced everywhere, but it's just the option definitely seems to be valuable in certain cases and to deny people that option, it looks like it's going to be more of a nuisance to people than not. I'm not saying, yes, if it moves or if it doesn't move, if it exists in an abstract realm, you know, that number, does it, is it owned yet? It's mine. No, I mean, that it would be crazy to try and own certain kinds of in intellectual objects. But who knows what kinds it might not be crazy to uh, own. Algorithms, whatever. Uh, there's a, the, the toast of pure mathematicians is supposed to be 
here's to pure mathematics, may it never do anybody any good. That's right, yes, that's John Hardy. But uh, uh, they, they say that it's usually something, there's an average of a seven year gap between a new invention in pure mathematics and some application in physics. Uh, oh. Now, whether, whether before you get on to... Too much mathematics. Before it, but technology may come even later, I don't know. So, yeah. But uh, a lot of things will just, I mean, universities may continue to run on the basis that, well, we're, we're not going to propertize. Or maybe they will. Maybe they'll say, one of the ways we fund our university is when we come up with a good invention, no, we claim it. I don't know. It's, but the option, to, the option to claim it ought to be there. But it can never be more, the claim can never be, in principle, for not so long that it runs over into like the independent invention or discovery and thereby you're simply claiming what you haven't produced and you're being a nuisance to other people. So that will always be a theoretical limit that ought to stop it being so frightening. The idea that somebody might own a piece of music or a book I think can't really be very frightening because you, your life is never going to depend on seeing a, a particular play or poem or whatever. It might depend on a, on a drug but then ultimately that drug's going to come out of copy, uh, come out of patent and then you'll get it. Uh, 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 and it wouldn't have been there in the first place if somebody didn't think, well, for a few years I'm going to be able to cash in on this. So uh, did you want to speak, Nico, or were you yeah, just yeah. Say, saying, it was just pointing to that chap out there? But you want to speak? Oh, no, no, no. No, 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 you, you were pointing to that chap, but did you also want to speak? Yeah, I want to speak. Um, I, I was wondering if there is a... Is a hierarchy of, of property in, in your theory, because it, it seems to me that, for example, practically imposition on my own body is, is worse than uh, practically imposition in, on my garden or something. Um, so, and if, if there is a, a hierarchy, I, I would, I would uh, think that uh, your theory about um, intellectual property might apply to certain areas and not to others. For example, if you own a song, you might have the copyright to to prevent people from copying it and then selling copies, but maybe preventing me from singing the song uh, with my own body, yeah. uh, wherever, uh, on a stage or whatever, might be too much of an imposition on me because it, it would affect my own body and that is yeah. a much higher form of, of, of property and a much uh, bigger form of imposition than, than I'm imposing on you by singing the song. I think it's more to do with what's practical, I mean, also, and also what's the loss to you. If you if you, if you write a hit song, you sort of want people to be singing it and enjoying it in, their, in private, otherwise, you know, they're not going to, if they thought they couldn't do that, they, you know, they, you know, they wouldn't uh, want anything to do with it. Yeah, first, but, but also, uh, uh, you can't, it's impractical to stop them, so... And, but, oh, but... For example, a cover band might sing the song live on in, in their show without recording it. Oh, but oh, they are. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, if it's cover version in a yeah, but if it's I would say if it's a commercial show, then uh, it looks like there's a loss to the original owner. If it's just a charity, then maybe there isn't. I don't know. But but yeah, in a sense, it's not so much that there's a hierarchy. It's that some uh, obviously some kinds of property are more important to be interfered with in your body. Other things being equal is usually worse than somebody trespassing by going through your back garden or something. You know, which is, you might not even know about. Or just so, yeah. In that sense, it's not. It's not so much a that there's a there's a there's a literal hierarchy of rights as to some things will uh, impose on you more, and the more intimate they are, the more likely they are to impose on you. Bob? But a question of personal Sorry. values, mind you. Some one, somebody might say, "I don't care what you did to my body," but that's what I care about. I'll lay down my life to preserve it. So it's personal as well. So, um, some people, all people in some ways, I've striven hard to make give myself the body I have today. <laughs> yes, you have. You worked hard. It's hard work, but I've put myself through. Sure. Yeah. But there are some leggy models with blonde hair and uh, good looks who have made themselves, in a sense, with the help of their parents and genetics and the rest of it, um, that, that they look they look corkers. Now, if someone takes a photograph of them in a public place, a place they don't own, let's say, yeah. probably a libertarian yeah. shopping mall, should they have image rights such that they should I feel, I've thought about stop this. you? Yeah, I thought, I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm inclined to, yeah, I th I'm inclined to, I'm inclined to be sympathetic to the idea to, that you do have uh, uh, some sort of 
uh, right to your own image and whatever, you know. I mean, yeah, it sort of makes sense. People are being a nuisance to you. If they're following you everywhere and taking photographs well, of you. It's a separate issue. This could be a long distance uh, lens, one photograph. Um, if, yeah, if it's, if it's sufficiently far away and it's just a crowd and it wasn't. But yeah, but if you're, somebody's following you around and doing it, then they're, they're definitely being a nuisance to you. And it could, it, it could be that they're being a nuisance to you in the sense that they're, you know, just deliberately uh, or unintentionally uh, preventing you from just going about and enjoying your life, or it could be that they're stealing an image. You're a famous person and they're stealing an image that you'd rather not give them. But uh, the, the, the easiest way might not be to do that in terms of bodily ownership, image rights, as just, as just well, what, what are the rules of this street? Yeah. Or what are the rules of this club? There are two separate things here. One is the... Catastrophe. <laughs> it's possible Let to that have, baby out. It's possible to have a rule because... There's too much of this going on, it's annoying, it's interrupting, it's all that, it's yeah. awesome. The other one is it was perfect, you didn't even know they were taking it. It's a wonderful picture, caught you just right, everyone wants it for their calendar, or this and that and the other. Why should you own that? I took the photograph, I saw how wonderful it was. That's I saw, what, I saw what the lighting was. That's the rule now, it's a photographer owns it. But if it's some would argue, if it's taken, yeah, yeah, well, again, if did he take it through your bedroom window? Yeah, that's uh, right. while you were looking while particularly you're splendid. Are you having a Nazi themed orgy? <laughs> you know, or, you know. So that's why I say maybe the the uh, maybe we don't need to. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I have some sympathy <laughs> to the idea that, that in in a sense people shouldn't just be allowed to pester you by taking photographs oh, no, of you wherever they go. This is just. But they're going to make money out of this image. Yeah. Now they had to work. Yeah, and you've so created in a that sense, image. The work is by yeah. the way, but the fact is, they just saw that, that was a good angle, a good shot. Yeah. Was, I've got to, pub, you know, start selling this image. Yeah. They, they've also worked. They've also homesteaded in a sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, is, uh, does it? You also own the words you've just said. Can I not go around with it? <laughs> yeah. You normally do, Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should we take a last David, question, a last yes. question? Last question before David. adjourning to the bar. Oh, right. yeah. stretching the notion of interfering with liberty perhaps yeah. further than one might comfortably take it. Yeah. Because and it does seem to be that really what we're talking about here is a <coughs> clash between the liberty on the one hand yeah. of people to copy ideas and to go on. And on the other hand the, the wealth or welfare or, or as Bob put it, the opportunities of the person who came up with the idea. So it seems to me actually you're getting a bit closer to a sort of a clash which I think you say can't exist, but I think it might exist here, between liberty on the one hand and welfare on the other hand. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Um, uh, uh, I mean, there's a... Really there, 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 there's a... Clash. There. Yeah, I mean, I should, okay, preface this by saying, I mean, one of the reasons... Uh, that liberty is so desirable is it does seem to go along with human welfare. Uh, that's you know, uh, 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 and so and if there were a clash, uh, that would um, you might want to go either way depending on how badly this might be one. clash. Well, but also there's a sense in which if something were to decrease welfare, depending on how it happened, you might say that that decrease in welfare is actually if it. If it's proactively imposed, then it's reducing liberty. Well, Depends. I'm just questioning whether we'd, that analysis really works here. Uh, 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 we, we, I think we'd need a concrete case to get a better grip on it, rather. The intellectual property rights. That's, uh, that's the case we're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, a particular uh, example. I mean, you're right. You're in the whole package. I mean, I can't. The whole pa as a whole, intellectual property rights look like. I invent the idea. I come up with the idea. You copy it. If I can stop you copying it, I'm definitely interfering with your liberty. But if, if you, but if, but if you, no, think, no, 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 no. I mean, well, if, 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 if this theory of uh, of propertizing ideologics is correct, then your creation or discovery of an object would automatically make you the owner. And if I try to copy you, I'm interfering with your liberty then because. You're starting with the property. Hmm? You're starting with the property. I'm uh, starting with property. Yes. Yeah. Which is not really the 
I'm a, I mean, I'm assuming... Your framework is pre-profiteering. Oh, uh, so yeah, because... Not. Yeah, no, because... Uh, if you are not allowed to uh, keep the fruits of your labour, in some sense, I've uh, interfered with you. I mean, I'm just taking I'm just taking something from you that I've seen that you that you've created. You certainly made me worse off. Then that may uh, and, and if you've and if you've made and a, if you've certainly if you've made it, let's. To take a clearer case, if you've made something just in order to sell it, and I say thank you very much, I'm going to do exactly the same thing, it's, then obviously I've interfered with your plans. Uh, I've done nothing except just take your idea. I've created nothing. I've seen what you've done. I've taken it. So in a sense, that's like I've seen that you've grown apples on your tree and I'm taking your apples. Thank you very much. Anyway. Anyway, thank you I'm very much indeed. Right, okay. And I hope it comes to the next meeting, which will not be on intellectual property rights. Oh, okay.